These are all of the stats challenge questions from the year two Pearson Excel textbook. We actually have to draw a scatter diagram. I'm not going to do that, obviously. Um, I'm, I'm going to do most of this question, just not this. Um, you take log of both sides here, and then this is a times t to the b, so the log separate to log of a plus log of t to the b. Then the b can come down. And now this is a y equals mx plus c line. As long as this is your y, and log t is your x, because t is the variable. Um, so that makes b the gradient, and log a the y and z. So yeah, log t is going to be your x-axis, log e is going to be your y-axis. You don't plot these points, of course. You plot log t and log e, so you make another table with log t and log e in it, all of these. That was really boring to do. And now I dislike this video all you want. I obviously don't care. I'm absolutely refusing to draw an accurate scatter graph, because, because why on earth would I do that? If you do this, it's pretty easy to tell that it's going to look like that if you do it, because one of them's going up and one of them's going down. So, okay. And then if apparently if you were to draw this accurately, you would see that this is roughly 1.09, which means log A equals 1.09, and the gradient would be roughly this. I'm not sure how you're supposed to get it that accurate. But, but sure, if you're using graph paper, maybe you can. But obviously I couldn't be bothered. Those are A and B. We obviously can't predict log zero because that would enable us or mean we'd have to do log of zero, which we're not going to do. So um, thus ends that massive waste of time question. And we do another complete waste of time question because this is asking us whether or not this is modeled better with this or with this. So we do take log of both sides of both. And uh, this one's going to become this because the A separates and then the X comes down. And this one, the D separate there and the N comes down. And what you need to do is you need to assess whether log y and x, because this is like y equals mx plus c here. So assess the relationship between log y and x. And here, assess the relationship between log y and log x, because those are the y's and the x's in your normal y equals mx plus c. So you need to make a table with log y and log x in it, and then you need to find, using a calculator, the r coefficient between log y and x here, which is this and the coefficient between log y and log x here, because those are the two uh, variables there, and you get this, and therefore this one's the better one. And uh, we have two complete waste of time questions done. So moving on to some maybe actually vaguely interesting maths. Independent, of course, means p of a times p of b is p of a and b. Um, and you could maybe just say that this, therefore, is p of a, p of b, p of c, but just to maybe at least vaguely hand wavy prove it. If you start with this, this is of course x, y, z based on these three things here. But also the first two definitely make p of a and b. And then you just need to say, well, if a, b, and c are independent, then that means a and b is independent to c, which means this, if you just replace this with a and b, would become a and b and c at the end there. And therefore, that's equal to x, y, z, just from that chain. And now this one here, um, now we can use maybe this rule here to jump us from intersections to unions. Um, so, okay, let's do that. And we can say, well, okay, if we want this to happen, uh, but we actually want this, let's just replace the A with an A U B every time. So so I've, I guess I've also replaced B with C. So I'm just using this formula here, but the A's have become A U B's, and the B's have just become C's, so we get this. Um, we already know, I guess, some things about this. We know P of A U B is this, because it's from this formula, A plus B, which is X plus Z, minus X, sorry, X plus Y, minus X Y. Again, based from this, this one coming from here. So that's just that bit. P of C is just Z, obviously. And now this bit here takes a bit of assessing, maybe. Um, but because these two things are independent, that means we can apply this rule. So A, U, B can be split out from the C, like this. And now this is just this again. And C is just Z. And it hasn't asked me to simplify that. So I'm just going to leave it like so. And this one, very similar idea, right? We can use the um, independence idea. To say that this is just p of a u b dashed times p of c, just replacing this with all of this stuff here and using this rule backwards. That's obviously just z. Um, this we could use this rule for if we wanted to, just replacing b with b dashed, and we get this. Um, and now, of course, because of independence, this is just p of a times p of b dashed. But p of b dashed, of course, is just 1 minus y because it's just the property of not being z. So that's 1 minus y, that's 1 minus y. These are a's. And this is a Z out here. This P of C is just a Z. And again, I, I can't be bothered to simplify that. That will just do. Okay, um, this one here. So we have um, the probability of X being 1 is K. And then probability of X being 2 is 2K and 3K and 4K and 5K. All of those probabilities must add up to 1. 
So factorize out the k and divide, and you get k as this. And so then we can maybe draw a table. It looks like this. Probably that x equals 5, given x is bigger than 2. These are the ones that are bigger than 2. This is the one that's 5, so it's just going to be this. The 15s all cancel, you get 5 over 3 plus 4 plus 5, which is this. And then probability of x is odd, given x is prime. Well, the odd ones are, well, firstly, we should think about the prime ones, because the prime ones are 2, 3, and 5. And of those, the odd ones are 3 and 5, so it's going to be this plus this over this, this, and this, uh, like so. And the 15s cancel again, so it just becomes 8 over uh, uh, 10, which is uh, 4 fifths. Good. Uh, next one is is very similar to kind of what we were doing before. Actually, no, it's not. This one is actually kind of interesting. Uh, the only way that I thought to do this was just drawing um, a scatter graph. I don't think I actually ended up needing this. Sorry, drawing a Venn diagram. <laughs> a scatter graph. I refuse to draw scatter graphs. That was the whole point. Anyway, drawing a Venn diagram. So P of A, you know this circle's got to be 0.6. This one's got to be 0.2. What you can do is you can just put 0 in the middle and make 0.6 here and 0.2 there. Now, I put this in red because this here is A intersected with B dashed, because that's the thing stuff in A and not in B. Uh, of course, that means 0.2 needs to go out here, and that means we've got a value of 0.6 um, in this case. But what if you put the maximal amount in the middle? In other words, a 0.2, of course, because then this would be 0 instead. Well, this would be 0.4, and then this would also be 0.4. And now you've got the probability is 0.4, so therefore I think P ranges between 0.6 and 0.4. Uh, so... I was unhappy with the second part of this question because um, this actually, I got this wrong because I didn't realize it was also like this had to be true up here. Like it's not part one, part two. It's like these two questions are the same question. So we still need to consider these two things up here, which I didn't realize. So I got it wrong and I was annoyed about that. Where is my third circle? There it is. That'll do. So P of A and B and C is 0 0.1. So that goes here. P of C is 0.7, so all of this is 0.7, but still P of A is 0.6 and P of A is, B is 0.2. Now, the thing that we want is A with not B with C. So that's going to be this one here, A and C, but also not B. So let's just make that zero and see if this works, right? So somewhere there needs to be 0.5 across these two circles. And somewhere there needs to be 0.1 across all three of these and together. And down here, there needs to be 0.6 across these two, just trying to get every circle to be what it needs to be. But if you if you if you sort of look at this, there's just too many numbers, I think. Um, there's just too many numbers to actually make this work. Like, if, if you put the 0 0.1 out here, then the 0 0.5 has to go over there. But now you've got way too much, so you try sharing stuff instead. 0 0.1 goes here, but then you still need a 0 0.5 over here and a 0 0.4 here. It still just adds up to too much. So this just doesn't work at all. So we cross it out, and we start again. And maybe just try a 0 0.2, um, just because, to see if that balances out a bit better. Uh, you could put the 0 0.1 here, just again, trying to wash away as many numbers from this A as possible. That leaves behind a point 0.1, I think, to go in the A. Sorry, a point 0.2, because 2 plus 2, 1 more 1, makes 6. Yeah, sorry. Uh, nothing in the B. And then, of course, it leaves behind a point 0.7 to go in, a point 0.4 to go in the C to make this a point 0.7. And this all works, right? This all works. So point 0.2 is something we can do. You can try doing a point 0.1, but you can think it through logically as well. And if you reduce this any further, you have to introduce stuff both into here and into here. There's no way to put any extra stuff into B. So this kind of logically must be the minimum amount you can do. Um, so, okay, we'll say that's fine. And now if we try and think about the maximum amount we can do, well, to do that, we want to put as much stuff over it on its own in B as possible so that we can then throw as much of A into this circle as possible, maybe. Um, so we'll put zero here and zero there. Um, so now we can overlap as much of A and C as possible. Because we've already used 0.1 of A, we only have 0.5 left. But that's okay, we'll put it there. And now there's point 0.1 left in C and 0 left in A, and this all works out as well because all these things add up to 1, I think. Uh, sorry, they don't. You've got a point 0.2 on the outside, but it's fine because all the circles add up to the right thing. So that's okay. Um, likewise, do we need something on the outside here? Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. No, we don't. And that's probably why this is also arguably a minimum. Anyway, we have Q is ranges between those two things, I guess, just using a bit of trial and error. Normal distribution, interquartile range. Okay, so interquartile range is when 25% of the data is below it and 25% of the data is above it. Fine. Show this is this. Okay, well, all you have to do is take the standard normal distribution and find the Z values that give you 0.25 behind and 0.75 behind, behind. So this is just inverse normal function on the calculator. I did it. It's obviously symmetrical, so you get this and this. What we can say is, let's call this kind of value X. 2 and this one x1 I think is what I ended up doing yeah so let's call this one x1 on the on the on the distribution we're talking about and we'll use this to jump from the standard to the distribution that we have so we have this 
And if we call this value x2, we could make the same thing here. If we just add these two results, to, sorry, if we do this one minus this one, um, because x1 minus x2 is this probability q, because we're told the interquartile range is that, um, if we do this, take away this, we'll get two lots of this thing, obviously. And then all of this cancels except for x1. You just end up with an x1 minus x2. Um, obviously, with the sigma one bottom times by sigma, this becomes p, sorry, q, because that's what the interquartile range is. And then if you divide, or times by sigma, and then divide by 1.39, you'll end up with what they wanted you to get, which is good. Explain why it's not possible to write mu in terms of q. Well, the only information you have is the interquartile range. And that doesn't change when you shift the thing left and right, thus changing mu. So this entire setup is completely independent of mu. So there's no way I can write anything intelligent about mu, because q is completely completely uh, disaligned from it. The interquartile range has, has, has no connection to the mean at all. Okay, cool. A film manager claims to have 48%, sum by 15, so this is just a binomial, n15, probability 0.48. Uh, probability of more than eight of these things is the same as one minus probability of less than eight to eight. Type that into a calculator to get this. It's not difficult. Uh, sample of 250, so 250 is a large number, 5% of significance. So if 250 is large and the probability is about 0.5, that means you can do a normal estimation, which would be np into np minus 1 minus p. np is 250 times 40, 0.48 and then times by 0.52 to get to this. Um, at this point, we can just, um, you know, just, just, well, I prefer to write this like this because that's the number I'm actually going to type into the calculator when we have sigma, because it's sigma squared, of course, should be here. Um, so, okay, well, let's just type it into the calculator. I'm looking for area 0 0.025 behind because this is a two tailed test. So, 0 0.025 behind gets you this number, and then you can, you can do the one above, or you can just find the difference between that and 120 and then just go above it. It's kind of up to you to get this. So, of course, that means the critical value is anything less than or equal to 104 and anything greater or equal to 136. 102 is inside that critical region, so the manager is wrong. Cool. And then it's interesting because the last two questions are just the two questions we just did with different numbers. They didn't have anything else that they could think of to write. So this is the same thing we were doing before where you draw a Venn diagram and just try and put as little in the intersection and then as much as in the intersection as you can. And uh, then vice versa, and then you do the same thing from down here. So put zero in the intersection, you get these two things. This is the one that we care about because they, again, couldn't even bother to ask you to find a different region. So P is 0.7 is a possible case. And then if you put as much in the intersection as possible, um, you get P is 0.4 is a, 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 um, a case that is possible. And now we do the same thing with three diagram. This is in the middle. It, it's uh, This is different in the sense that you're looking for this one now not A and B and C. So, okay, put zero there, see if that's possible. It turns out that it is, I think, um, if I remember correctly, um, or if I remember not correctly. Why did I put this down? Did I, did, I, did I, I think this is just me demonstrating where the numbers sort of roughly need to be. And now I'm actually just going to do it. So put 0.25 here. That means you've got 0.3 in total, which means 0.35, sorry, means 0.4 needs to go here. Yeah, because that adds up to 0.7. And then you've got 0.45 right now, so you need another 0 0.05. And B has the right thing? Cool. So 0 is totally a possible case. And then let's try and make this number as big as possible. So let's maybe put the 0.25 in there, I imagine, is what we should be doing. Good. That means a 0 goes there. And then I guess we just need to decide how to match these. In fact, it doesn't even, well, it does sort of matter because we need to check that it's a case that is possible. And it is. We put a 0.2 there which leaves behind zero down there because that already makes 0 0.5 and then that cool adds up. So they're going to range between those two things there. Just a bit of trial and error again. And then we have another question that is identical to the football question, um, except we're not going to bother doing a binomial first. We're going to go straight into the normal distribution estimation, which we'll write like this. Just doing a bit of timesing. Uh, we want area 0 0.5 either side this time. So we're just going to go into the calculator and look for when that is. And then again, we can use symmetry to work out this value. And so below 144 or equal to and above 174 or equal to are going to be our critical regions. 173 is just inside the critical region, so therefore we accept H0. And that is, I didn't actually even bother writing down the critical regions. Amazing. Well, I said them out loud, so that's good enough. And, uh, and that's all of that one. I really enjoyed it.